So all right, thanks again for being with us. It's my great pleasure now to introduce the first speaker of the day, Dr. Adam Boxer. Dr. Boxer received his MD and PhD degrees. Oh, not yet, not yet. <laughs> when the man himself comes up. Uh, as part of a National Institute of Health funded medical scientist training program at New York University Medical Center. He completed a residency in neurology at Stanford and a fellowship in behavioral neurology at UCSF. Dr. Boxer holds the Vera and John Graziat Graziadio Chair in Alzheimer's Disease and he is an Associate Professor of Neurology at UCSF. He directs the Clinical Trials Program for Alzheimer's Disease and Frontal Temporal Dementia at UCSF Memory and Aging Center and has been active in, has an active research program focused on therapeutic development and biomarkers in neurodegenerative diseases. Dr. Boxer is the recipient of the 2002 Edwin Baldry Award from the San Francisco Neurological Society for basic research in neurological disease and the 2005 John Douglas French Foundation Alzheimer's Award. And just recently, the Alzheimer's Association was delighted to present uh, Adam with a, a research award that came from our Park the Cloud fundraiser. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have been able to do that. I would also say that Adam serves on the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council for the Alzheimer's Association in Northern California and Northern Nevada. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Boxer. Okay. Okay. Well, um, Bill, thank you for the really very kind introduction, and it's a great pleasure to uh, to speak with all of you today. Um, I want to again thank the Alzheimer's Association for all of their support over the years of my work and our work at UCSF and in the Bay Area, and particularly the the Park the Cloud program, which we are really excited about because it's allowing us to bring new therapies to patients with Alzheimer's disease, which we think is really very important. So um, today I'm, I'm going to tell you about what is going on in research in Alzheimer's disease, and I'm particularly interested in therapies and, and finding ways that we can actually improve the quality of life of people with memory impairments and other forms of neurodegeneration. And, and I think that 2014 is going to be really one of the most exciting years, perhaps the most exciting year in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease that we've seen in a very long time. Um, and that's because there have been a, really a lot of advances over the past year that are really enabling us to, to bring exciting new therapies to our patients. Um, so uh, I would like to show this slide first. Um, there's been a huge amount of work um, by my colleagues and others trying to think about, you know, not just treating Alzheimer's disease, but how, how can we prevent ourselves from even having memory impairments in the first place? And so this is some work from my colleague Christine Yaffe at, at UCSF, where she really tried to figure out, by looking at a large population of older adults and looking at them over a number of years, to figure out who, who aged well and didn't develop any, even the slightest hint of memory impairment, and who uh, didn't do quite so well, and maybe was in the earliest stages of, of memory impairments and even Alzheimer's disease. And so, basically, the first thing you should know is that really um, don't get old, because aging is, is really associated with memory problems. Spend lots of time in school, like me, I spent about 30 years, I think, in different forms of training, so that's pretty good. Um, you know, read as well as you can. Don't smoke, uh, exercise, don't be a caregiver. And I think a lot of people um, in this room, probably it might be a little bit too late for uh, all of us. I'm a caregiver as well for my parents, so um, I know the stress is involved. And um, unfortunately, it's not realistic for us not to be caregivers. But um, you know, have good social support, work or volunteer, and drink maybe a little bit of alcohol, don't overdo it, but there's some evidence that people who have it, maybe a glass of wine a night do a little bit better. Um, and, and Christine and her colleagues have really suggested that if we could all really adhere to all these rules and maybe a, a heart a healthy lifestyle, we might really prevent a large number of cases of Alzheimer's disease, and, and I think that that's a really laudable goal, and we're all, we should all keep these factors in mind as we get older, but 
Um, you know, not everyone can do that, and even if we age successfully, some people just are not lucky for whatever reason, and they begin to develop memory problems. And um, eventually, the most common cause of memory problems in most older people is Alzheimer's disease. And I just thought I'd uh, put on my neurologist hat because I take care of patients in the clinic and just sort of um, give you a, a sense of really how we diagnose and manage Alzheimer's disease in about one minute. <laughs> so um, uh, just to remind you where we've been for the past 10 or 15 years and, and let you know where we're going in the future. So um, when patients come into our clinic, usually uh, it's either them or their more commonly their family complains they have memory problems. As uh, the physician who's seeing this patient, we often test their memory, find out what's going on, do some blood tests, and if they have a little bit of a memory impairment and it's clearly present and their family notices it, we can measure it, then we call it, um, we call it mild cognitive impairment. Let's see, can you see that? That's not coming up. Um, let's see if I can get a pointer here. Um, So um, I'll use this pointer. So, um, so we call it either mild cognitive impairment if the person has memory problems but uh, they're able to compensate or if the memory problems are severe enough to really get in the way of their day-to-day -day life, we call this Alzheimer's disease or, or some form of dementia if it's not Alzheimer's disease. And, Currently, there are a number of different medications that are approved by the FDA for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. We also recommend exercise and, as I said, minimizing your cardiovascular risk factors because being heart healthy probably helps you to deal with these diseases. We try and uh, minimize other drugs that act in the brain that can cause problems for people with memory problems. And we're pretty good at actually treating some of the behavior and psychiatric problems that arise in the setting of memory problems. And importantly, as I mentioned, you know, caregivers are really uh, important for our patients. And if a caregiver is stressed and, and sick themselves, they can't take good care of their patient. And so we try to really provide caregiver support. And, and, and we have to acknowledge that Alzheimer's disease causes death in many patients or accelerates death. And, and we feel it is important to manage this end of life and think about hospice cares and other things like that. And so this is what we currently do for Alzheimer's disease patients, but in the future, I hope it's going to be very different. And as I mentioned, there are four uh, commonly used FDA-approved therapies. Um, they help a little bit, but unfortunately, they don't help enough. And so many of us are working on new uh, therapies to treat Alzheimer's disease. And so what do these therapies do? And I apologize for this complicated graph, but this is sort of, um, as someone who develops therapies, this is how we figure out whether they work. So this is from a clinical trial of one of the therapies that we most commonly use called denepazil. And you can see on, on the uh, y-axis, this is a measure of people's memory of cognitive function, and this is time in weeks. And you can see the people who got a placebo or a sugar pill, um, over time, actually their memory got worse, but people who got uh, this denepazil um, did a little bit better uh, over time. And uh, that was why the FDA approved this, uh, this medication for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, but what we know is that although these drugs are, are a little bit helpful, they're probably not treating the underlying disease. And we know this because if we actually follow these patients a little bit longer, we find that even though initially the drugs appeared to help, the patients uh, who are getting the drugs appear to decline at approximately the same rate as the people who got placebo. And if we stop the, oops, if we stop the medications, um, what we see is uh, that the person who was on the drug eventually goes right back to where they would have been if they weren't taking the medications. So we think these current medications help the brain to work a little bit more efficiently. They, they jazz up the brain a little bit, but they're not treating the underlying disease. And, and we're working to try and find better treatments. And just my last slide about medications. This being said, um, even though we don't, we think that these medications don't treat the underlying disease, we think that people should probably be taking them. And this is work from Oscar Lopez, just looking at a large number of patients in the, in the community, and 
looking at how long it took people with Alzheimer's disease to be placed in nursing home. And what he found is that people who actually took these medications, even though they're not perfect, um, were able to stay at home a lot longer. Um, so this is people who were staying at home a lot longer than people who did not take either of the medications. And so it suggests that although the medications aren't great, they are still something that people should be taking, and we recommend that most of our patients take this. And, um, this is a slide that I stole uh, from the Alzheimer's Association, and I showed a lot. And this is just to remind you that despite um, these medications that help a little bit, this Alzheimer's disease is really getting to be a big problem in our society and really in the world for public health. It's, it's very uh, uh, expensive and it's going to create a huge burden for our healthcare system. And although um, we've made a lot of progress in other forms of disease uh, like cancer and heart disease, um, really uh, the number of, of uh, the, the importance of Alzheimer's disease as a cause of death and morbidity and healthcare expense in our, in our country is really increasing disproportionately to almost every other disease. And so we really need to focus on this. And um, I think finally, after many years, the federal government is starting to catch on to this. President Obama signed the National Alzheimer's Project Act, I believe it was last year. And this is starting to raise awareness that we really need to be devoting a, a lot more effort, both in terms of research, in terms of patient care, and, and really thinking about how, we, how our society wants to deal with this problem in the future. Um, and, and really, uh, what, why we're so worried about this is because as the baby boomer population ages, we expect that the number of cases of Alzheimer's disease in this country is going to increase uh, probably up to about 13 or 14 million uh, patients just with Alzheimer's disease, and this doesn't count other forms of dementia and patients with mild cognitive impairment by mid-century. And so uh, this is a huge public health emergency. It's an epidemic, and we really need to find some better treatments that treat the underlying causes of Alzheimer's disease in their generation. And so to do that, we're going to have to talk a little bit about the molecules of Alzheimer's disease and the proteins and what we see under the microscope. And just to orient you to this, uh, for over 100 years, people have been taking care of Alzheimer's patients and looking at their brains under the microscope and, and using um, very simple sort of stains with silver. Typically, we see two types of things under the microscope. One is uh, called... Uh, <laughs> an amyloid plaque, which is this sort of black fried egg thing, and these other things are called neurofibrillary tangles. And these are really the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And after about, let's say, 50 to 100 years of research, um, we realized that there are two proteins that make up these, these things, these abnormal deposits that we see under the microscope in patients who die from Alzheimer's disease. One is called um, the beta amyloid protein, or amyloid, and that makes up these fried egg plaques. And they, in these tangles, there's another protein called tau. And, and I think what I'm going to tell you today is that these are really the targets that, for the new drugs that we're developing for Alzheimer's disease. And we think that if we could block the accumulation either of the plaques or the tangles or both, that this would really be the cure we're looking for, and this would have a huge impact on future disease. And we've been aided uh, in our development of these drugs by our friends uh, in the mouse community. Uh, and so you can actually uh, take the genes that, are, that produce the uh, amyloid or tau and put them into a mouse using genetic engineering and create something called Mouseheimer's disease. And um, these are mice who develop plaques and tangles in their brain, and they get memory problems just like human Alzheimer's disease. They're not exactly like Alzheimer's disease, but they're very useful for developing drugs. So we can identify drugs, test them in Alzheimer's, and if they cure Alzheimer's, we think they may have a chance of curing Alzheimer's disease. And so that's been the approach over the past 10 or 15 years in developing new treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And, and as an aside, I should say, if you're a Alzheimer's patient, you're in really good shape because we've cured Alzheimer's disease probably two or three hundred times over the past decade. Um, and uh, I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Unfortunately, many of those drugs haven't worked quite as well for human Alzheimer's disease, but we're starting to understand why that is, and we're refining our methods and approaches to treating Alzheimer's disease based on our experience. So um, now we're going to zoom in. We, we looked at these big plaques and tangles under the microscope.
now we're going to get even smaller, even down to the cellular level of uh, a, a nerve cell um, and with Alzheimer's disease. And so this is the inside of the cell. This is what we call the cell membrane. And um, I apologize that I don't have a pointer that can hit both sides. But um, these are some of the targets that we've identified for therapies for Alzheimer's disease. And um, out here is that amyloid plaque that I showed you before that we think is important for Alzheimer's disease. And then here are the neurocellular tangles. And so for the past decade or so, we've had drugs that somehow one way or another either block the formation of, of amyloid plaques by blocking some of the proteins that create amyloid, or they directly remove the amyloid. Uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you about, a little bit about the results of uh, some of the trials uh, that we've done in humans uh, with these drugs that target Alzheimer's um, uh, amyloid. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to come back and tell you about the next generation of therapies that we're working on that are targeting these, uh, these tangles or this protein called tau. Um, and so just a, a word of caution, I, I told you we're really excited about all of these new drugs that have been developed that, um, that really target amyloid and target the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease. But unfortunately, although all of these drugs cured Alzheimer's disease, none of them so far have really um, been proven to have a major benefit for humans with Alzheimer's disease. And so we've seen uh, really over the past decade a huge number, this is probably only half of the number of large clinical trials in humans that have been negative, that have shown no clear benefit of a drug that looked great in mice but didn't work so well in humans. And so the question is, why is this? And should we be discouraged? And what can we do about it? And um, should we just give up? And the answer is no. Um, despite all of these negative experiences, we've learned a lot. And we think we understand why many of these drugs didn't work. And, um, I don't know whether Ruth Gay is going to touch on this later, but I saw that uh, she's going to talk about the role of an industry. So I thought I'd put it in my industry slide. So um, I think we're in a little bit of a, 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 unique, a unique situation in this country where we it's so expensive to develop drugs for Alzheimer's disease that we have to partner with the federal government, with private foundations like the Alzheimer's Association, but also the pharmaceutical industry. And what we learned over the past decade was that many of the drugs that were rushed into large-scale clinical trials probably were, were done so basically on a gamble. There was a slight chance they might have worked, but really it was, it, the odds were not so good. And, it, and some of the companies that pushed them into clinical trials uh, were in a rush to make as much money as possible and really ended up putting sort of lipstick on, on pigs, yes. so, on drugs that, that didn't didn't probably deserve to make it to the final stages of clinical trials. And so, so we've learned, and I think the pharmaceutical industry has learned that we need to be cautious, we need to be more rigorous about the science, we need to be really sure that when we take a, a drug into the final stages of human clinical trials that we're sure that it's really affecting the underlying biology of Alzheimer's disease. And so this is, despite all these failures after the past decade, we've learned how to do this a lot better. And I think in the future, we're going to be doing trials that have a much greater chance of success. So one of the, the silver linings of all these negative trials, the last one on my list of negative trials, was a drug called solanuzumab. And this uh, is going to feature very prominently in all of uh, many of the new clinical trials that are going on now and that will happen in the next year or two. And this is a monoclonal antibody, so it's a protein similar to what your body would generate in response to an infection or a vaccine. So it's a protein that the immune system uses to clear um, infectious agents. And this time, uh, a company has developed a monoclonal antibody that actually clears the amyloid protein, those fried egg appearing things under the microscope from people's brains. And what they found is that um, Although the clinical trials uh, for this uh, drug in, uh, were negative in patients with full-blown Alzheimer's disease, if they looked at the mildest patients, so people who just had you know, very mild, clearly had Alzheimer's disease, but they weren't very severely affected, and they looked and combined all of their data of about 2,000 patients, they found that the people who actually were treated with the medication and um, on the y-axis uh, is is again a measure of how severe your memory impairment is, and on the x-axis is time, that um, people who actually got the drug did a little bit better over time. 
than people who didn't. And so we're starting to see this more and more that, that some of these drugs had a hint uh, that they might be working, but something about how we tested them wasn't optimal. And so why might this be? And so, um, mo uh, uh, as I said, most of the drugs we've been working on for the past 10 years have been focusing on this one protein called amyloid. And what we know is uh, we've learned a lot about how amyloid builds up in the brain, how it relates to Alzheimer's disease, and how it relates to this other protein called tau. And when we think about this, it sort of makes sense why some of these clinical trials were not successful, even if the drugs might really have worked. So what we know is um, every, almost everyone who gets Alzheimer's disease starts out being cognitively normal. Eventually, they have very mild symptoms that we call mild cognitive impairment. I, I mentioned these before. This is someone who has a memory problem but is still able to compensate for their memory problems in day-to-day -day life. Uh, and, but when they're no longer able to compensate, they, we call this dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And what we've learned over uh, the past decade is that the amyloid in the brain, these, these Friday plaque things, um, starts to accumulate long before anyone has symptoms, probably 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years before people have symptoms, the amyloid levels in the brain and the amount of these fried egg things is really building up. And by the time you have symptoms, the brain is really chock full of amyloid. And it's been sitting there for probably decades. What we also know is that this other protein, those tangles that I showed you called tau, actually doesn't start to build up in the brain until much later. And the buildup of tau actually um, parallels much more closely the development of symptoms. So just when you start to have the earliest memory impairments that people can actually see in day-to-day day -day life is when the tau starts to build up. And the tau levels probably are increasing over time uh, in parallel with the severity of the disease. So. So when we had done all of these failed clinical trials, or these negative, I should say, clinical trials with anti-amyloid agents, we were taking a drug that targets this amyloid, but we were giving it to people 20 or 30 years after the amyloid had already built up, which was probably too late because it's been sitting there for a long time doing nasty things to the brain. And by that point, it, it, you know, it may be too late to remove the amyloid. And so, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more, but one new approach that we're thinking about is how can we give this amyloid removing drug earlier, maybe back here, when removing it might actually have a big impact. The other approach that I'm going to focus on at the end is, is well, maybe, you know, even though we think amyloid is a really important protein that is involved in causing Alzheimer's disease, uh, maybe it's not the best target for a therapy. And the next generation of drugs that we're very much uh, excited about are targeting this protein called tau. And maybe if we could actually impact the buildup of tau, that would have an even bigger effect. So how do we know that amyloid is building up 10, 20, 30 years before people even have symptoms? Well, we have new types of brain scans that actually can show us, and, and um, these are, this is a, 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 a scan called a positron emission tomography scan, or PET scan, that actually can detect this red stuff is an amyloid in, in a living person's brain, if the amyloid building up. And we can even see that certain drugs, um, so this was one of the drugs, like solanuzumab, that looked promising initially, that over time can remove the amyloid from the brain. And, um, we think that we can use these scans, and in fact, um, this is one really important study that came out uh, last year uh, that was uh, in patients with genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease, where all of these different colored lines basically are either amyloid or other markers of amyloid, tau, or brain uh, imaging, and that were, uh, they were able to demonstrate were starting to change in people uh, this is years before they got sick from Alzheimer's disease, so they could even see um, and uh, you know, 10, 20, or even more than 20 years before people really developed Alzheimer's disease, and this is in a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease that these things are changing. So we can actually measure the buildup of amyloid long before anyone even gets symptoms, and this offers us a real opportunity for intervening with one of these therapies. And so one of the, one of the clinical trials that has just started up is in these genetic forms of Alzheimer's disease, we're going to be comparing two anti-amyloid treatments. 
And the idea is that we're going to give them to people not after they already have Alzheimer's disease, but we're going to predict when they get Alzheimer's disease and we're going to give one of these amyloid removing drugs. Uh, and hopefully, if it works, then they will either not get sick or there will be a huge delay in the time of uh, memory impairments. But unfortunately, um, this approach pretty much only works in the rarest form of genetic Alzheimer's disease. What about the rest of us? What about the 99.9% .9 of everyone else who doesn't have a genetic form uh, or a very strong genetic form of Alzheimer's disease? Well. As part of the National Alzheimer's Project Act, one of the projects that was funded was called the A4 study. And um, this is another very exciting study that we're just starting up now. It's uh, starting up around the country. Um, and this is I taking, uh, looking at normal older people ages 65 to 85. And it's funded by both the federal government as well as by the drug company that makes that solanuzumab drug. And what we're doing is we're taking people, so you're just a normal person between ages 65 and 85, you get one of these amyloid PET scans, the ones that I showed you before, and if you're negative, um, if you don't have any amyloid in your brain, at least you really have to have no memory problems, then we just sort of follow you just to see what happens over time. Oops, sorry about that. And, but if you have amyloid in your brain but no symptoms, people will either get randomized to receive that solanuzumab drug that I showed you that looked promising to remove amyloid or placebo and we'll look about two years later and see could we remove the amyloid for people's brains who had no symptoms or cognitively normal. This is in the period before they had any hint, a whiff of any sort of memory impairment. And, and to look to see whether removing amyloid really might make a difference. And, I think many of us are very hopeful that it might, that if we actually do our clinical trials this way, as opposed to giving amyloid drugs to people who already have Alzheimer's disease, we might actually see a benefit. And so this general approach is called prevention. Um, and so instead of waiting till people who uh, have full-blown Alzheimer's disease, we'd use a test like amyloid imaging. We'd identify people who are maybe 10 or 20 years out from getting symptoms and then use the drug to actually block the buildup of amyloid or other things that might cause Alzheimer's disease so they never get sick. And I think this is one of the really promising approaches that we're going to be testing for the first time this year in 2014. So this, this really has, I think, a much better chance of success than everything we've done in the past 10 years. And not only is there the Diane study and the A4 study, but there are going to be two other large prevention trials going on around. So I think we're going to really put this, this uh, idea to the test in 2014, and there's a much better chance that it's going to work than I think the trials we've done in the past. Um, I think we also, though, have to be realistic, and we can't put all of our eggs in one basket. And I mentioned that amyloid seems like a promising target for Alzheimer's disease, but there are a lot of caveats to this um, uh, prevention approach, and, and I won't go through them all, but what I want to say is that, you know, we need to focus on other ideas besides just amyloid. And it may be that, as I showed you earlier, tau, this protein that forms the neurofibrillary tangles within the cells, is a much better target for a drug to treat Alzheimer's disease because the buildup of these neurofibrillary tangles uh, in cells and in the brain is much more tightly correlated with the development of symptoms. Uh, than uh, the buildup of amyloid. And so really, maybe just reducing tau levels enough might really have a much bigger impact than working on amyloid. So um, based on this idea, uh, many people have been working to develop uh, uh, drugs that target different aspects of tau biology. And I'll mention just the, the first ones we're going to be using and that we actually are using uh, now uh, in patients. Uh, but we think that this may be even more promising than the drugs we've been testing um, in the past. So uh, the first one that I'm going to tell you about is uh, tau. Actually, let me go back one slide. So tau is an interesting protein. And what it does is it stabilizes these structures in the nerve cells. So here's a nerve cell. And these structures are called microtubules. And if you see the picture of a nerve cell, it looks like a beautiful tree with all of these branches. And what actually allows the nerve cell to maintain its beautiful structure with all the branches are these microtubules. And when you don't have tau, or when the tau gets sick, the microtubules fall apart, and the, the cell starts to shrivel up, and it can't communicate with other cells, and then it dies. 
And at the very end, you get these neurofibrillary tangles. So one idea is that the reason why people have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease related to tau is that the, neuro, the microtubules are falling apart and that the cell can't function. And so um, the first uh, class of drugs that we're uh, using is actually designed to restore the stability of these microtubules. So here's another picture of a microtubule in a normal nerve cell. It looks like a nice tube. It's nice and stable and, and, and can help the cell to maintain this nice shape. But when you get Alzheimer's disease, it starts to fall apart and all the little pieces fall apart. And so actually, with support of the Alzheimer's Association, the Northern California Alzheimer's Association, I should say, as part of the, part of the CLOUDS program, we're testing a drug called TPI-287 in patients with Alzheimer's disease. That actually what it does is it takes the place of this cow that's getting sick and it actually stabilizes the microtubules. And so um, we're very excited about this. We just enrolled our first patient in the study and uh, we hope that this may be a much better way to treat Alzheimer's disease than by focusing on amyloid. Um, but we're not going to stop here. I mean, we need, there are a lot of other promising targets related to tau. And I think probably the most excitement that we've had um, also, again, just over the past year in terms of tau is learning a lot about how tau may be involved in neurodegeneration. And so one thing that's been really surprising to people is that tau, this toxic protein that forms those tangles, is probably actually spreading throughout the brain and it's spreading from one nerve cell to another. So here's cell number one, here's a tangle, here's cell number two, and it's probably spreading um, through the synapses from one cell to another and it's probably spreading um, first in Alzheimer's disease through the memory network in the brain. So they're just like there are networks in your computers and networks on the internet, there are networks in your brain and when you get a little bit of this toxic tau in your memory network, it's probably spreading from one part of the memory network throughout the rest of the brain, and this may underlie why people have a certain progression of symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Well, some of our colleagues have figured this out, and, and it's been a lot of work, but what they figured out is that um, when, the, when this toxic tau protein spreads from one cell to another, it's actually getting outside of the cell. And this means we can take one of those antibodies that I showed you before, and we can actually take these antibodies and block the spread from one cell to another. So here's, here's a slice of a brain uh, of a Mouseheimer's mouse that's chock full of, of tau uh, because it has Mousheimer's disease. And what uh, our colleague, my colleague Dave Holtzman and Mark Diamond at Washington University did is they developed antibodies that just block the spread from one cell to another. And they showed that, that this, the, the brain, the, the, uh, this mouse's brother, who got the antibodies that blocked the spread, was completely, um, almost completely protected from Alzheimer's disease. So, so we think this is really exciting. And we are also going to see human versions of these antibodies within 2014 uh, used to treat some of these diseases. And um, there are other examples, or this is just another uh, example of an antibody used in a different Alzheimer's mouse. I won't go through the details, but let's just say um, there's now many examples of this Mouseheimer antibody, this tau antibody, having a, a real benefit in Alzheimer's disease. And we think that this is, you know, in my mind, one of the most exciting new developments in treating our patients with Alzheimer's disease. And if that weren't good enough, well, we, you know, I think this is really exciting in and of itself. But even better, just a couple of months ago, we heard about a new imaging technique. So I showed you that in the past, um, we were really, we've really been aided in our efforts to develop um, uh, therapies, amyloid therapies, by having a scan called an amyloid PET scan that could detect amyloid in living brains. And so in this column, uh, all the way on your, uh, um, over here on the, on the left, uh, is the, uh, this amyloid scan, so you can see here's a normal person, um, and here's a person with Alzheimer's disease filled with amyloid. But um, now a number of groups have developed the technology to also image tau in the brain. And this is something we thought we were never going to be able to do. And then just lo and behold, six months ago, we heard the first reports that someone was able to do this. And so the combination of drugs that can remove tau tau being a much better target for than amyloid uh, because it's much more closely linked to the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, 
and now having the ability to actually look at it in human patients with Alzheimer's uh, and other forms of degeneration really is exciting. And, and we think that this, this really gives us great hope and a whole, you know, an order of magnitude more energy and excitement than we had, um, you know, even a year ago for, for treating our patients. And so I'm, I'm super pumped about this. And I think really, I really do believe that 2014 is going to be a great year for us. So I thought I would also mention, you know, we've learned our lessons and we've taken our licks with amyloid uh, clinical trials and in Alzheimer's disease, and we also have to think about, well, you know, we think tau is a great treatment and a great target for Alzheimer's disease, but maybe there are more efficient groups of people who we should be testing these tau therapies in, and I'll show you, tell you a minute why, but tau is not only a cause of Alzheimer's disease, but it causes a whole number of other both common and uncommon brain diseases, and one of the ones you may have heard a lot about in, in the NFL players is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And that's actually a very severe form of tau-related disease, and it occurs not only in, in athletes, but also in our veterans coming home from the different wars. And so um, we think that also developing tau therapies may find a use in some of these diseases. And conversely, some of these diseases may enable us to develop tau therapies more quickly that may find a role uh, that may actually be useful for treating Alzheimer's disease. And the reason why I say this is that another insight, another lesson we've learned over the past decade from all these failed Alzheimer's clinical trials is that Alzheimer's disease is not as simple as Alzheimer's disease. In mice, we can put amyloid and tau into the brain and say, okay, they have Alzheimer's disease. But if we look at all humans, and this is work from my colleague Julie Schneider at Rush uh, in, in uh, Chicago, um, if we look at everyone who comes into a uh, research neurology clinic with Alzheimer's disease and then follow them all the way to autopsy to the point where we take their brain out and look exactly well, what did they really have under the microscope, the minority of people actually have pure Alzheimer's disease, less than 50% in our series. And uh, this has been confirmed in other theories as well. And the majority of people have some combination of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, strokes, and even other kinds of proteins. And so it may be that another reason why we weren't as successful as we would have liked to be with our other treatments was that there are other toxic proteins or strokes or other things getting in the way of measuring the benefits of one of these new treatments. And so we're taking, and so just to remind you, in Alzheimer's disease, there's all these different toxic proteins and things going on, but there are other diseases that involve tau where we can be pretty confident that there's nothing else that's causing the disease, it's just tau. And so at our program at UCSF, we're focusing particularly on these diseases called primary tauopathies because we know that if we test one of these tau-related drugs in this disease, it's not going to, the effects aren't going to be blocked by amyloid or or, or Parkinson's proteins or anything else. Um, and we also know that um, because these are rare diseases, that there are a lot of uh, advantages to actually doing clinical trials. And I won't go through all these, but um, even the FDA allows us to do accelerated forms of clinical trials. We know that these diseases are even more severe in some ways than Alzheimer's disease, so um, we can do a clinical trial more quickly and more efficiently. And um, Unfortunately, unlike Alzheimer's disease, we have nothing right now to treat these disorders. And um, this is uh, a slide that I, I like to show from Lon Schneider, which is really, I think, a problem with our healthcare system in general, but it particularly applies to our patients with frontotemporal dementia, which is, you know, I think everyone in this country, we all just want to take a pill um, and to treat whatever that ails us. And, for many diseases, really, this approach hasn't changed for about 2,000 years. So Galen was a famous uh, physician uh, in Roman times, 100, year 180 AD, and he basically had these remedies that, and he said, well, I am a fantastic physician, and I have drugs that are going to treat your Alzheimer's disease, and everyone who takes these diseases, who, who drink of this remedy, recover in a short time, except those for whom it does not work, help, who all die. Therefore, it's obvious that it only fails in incurable cases. And so, um, 
I'd like to say that we, that we don't do this anymore, but those of you who look on the internet for memory uh, therapy probably have seen uh, some form of disclaimer uh, like this uh, for things like, I won't even go into them, but uh, for many treatments. And so uh, just to come back to these new diseases like frontotemporal and dementia and other pure telepathies, this actually allows us to treat, to test these treatments without any effective therapies that might compete. Um, We've recently developed the methods to do clinical trials uh, in these populations. I won't go through the, the, the details, but just to, to uh, suffice it to say that we've tested some of the Alzheimer's drugs, like Medicaid in these patients, and unfortunately, not only did it not help patients with FDD, uh, did Medicaid not help, but it probably made their cognitive function worse. So we're going to need specific drugs. I'm going to skip the next slide. Um, Finally, uh, we've also developed international networks that can support uh, large trials of tau-related therapies. And one disease that we're focusing on is purely tau, it's called progressive supranuclear palsy. And um, just a little less than a year ago, we finished a large trial where we organized three continents to test a tau drug uh, that targeted microtubules in PSP. And, what we found is that it wasn't efficacious, but we were able to demonstrate that we can actually do these large clinical trials of tau therapies. And so um, we now have projects underway to actually develop better biomarkers to focus on tau. And what we hope is that, again, by developing these tau therapies in parallel for these other pure tauopathies, that we're more likely to find, uh, maybe more efficiently able to find a, a tau therapy for Alzheimer's disease. And I think finally the, the last, the most exciting thing is that with this tau imaging, we can even start to detect tau in people who have genetic causes of tau buildup even before they get amyloid or anything else. And so uh, this is really a, a very exciting development that offers a lot of possibilities for development of tau therapies. So um, just wanted to uh, invite all of you to participate in our research. We have a new Neuroscience uh, Research Center up at UCSF that just opened a year ago. Uh, I, on the first floor, we have all clinical research, and I direct a clinical research unit there. And then the top four floors are our uh, our basic science labs. We're, we're developing new therapies that we can test in patients with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of uh, neurodegeneration on the first floor. And this is our uh, neuroscientist clinical research unit. This is that I direct. This is the waiting room where you can uh, come and sit, and this is the hallway, the lobby of our building. And inside our clinical research unit, we have two MRI scanners uh, and all kinds of specialized equipment where we'll really be able to tell with much better accuracy, much better, um, much more better sensitivity than in the past whether any of these drugs work. Uh, and so with that, I'm just going to end, and I'm going to thank uh, all of you for your attention and your patience with me. And uh, many different people who've helped with all the different work that I've showed you, and particularly wanted to thank the Alzheimer's Association for inviting me to speak to you and for their support of all of our work. And uh, thank you very much.